All right, so now I'd like to introduce Stephen Lee, uh, Dr. Stephen Lee. Um, he's had a pretty varied career, having spent time both within the national lab system at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, and also having spent some time in academia at MIT. Um, now he is in the Department of Energy, where he works as an applied mathematics program manager, and uh, we'll hear more from him now. Let's welcome him. Great. Can, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. Uh, so a little bit of background. Um, I did my graduate degree at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign back in the uh, late 80s. I was a big fan of MATLAB, and of course, Urbana-Champaign is the home of Mathematica. So I'm a big fan of, of those languages, and I'm becoming a big fan of Julia. And uh, what this talk is about is to give you some context and information about advanced scientific computing at the Department of Energy, and just sort of think broadly about what role Julia can play as part of that. So um, I wear two hats in, in, in DOE. I am the, uh, one of the applied math program managers, and I'm also an acting research division director for OSCAR. So within the Department of Energy, there's an Office of Science it's basically a $5 billion a year uh, operation, uh, and it has a mission. Um, people often think that DOE stands for Department of Everything, but that's not true. It stands for the Department of Energy, and they focus on delivering scientific discoveries and tools to transform our understanding of, of nature and advancing the you know, energy, economic, and national security of the U.S. And broadly speaking, it's broken into two pieces. On, on the one side is research. So we support about half of the physical scientists uh, in basic research uh, through the Department of Energy. And from the bar chart that you see up there, there are other funding agencies uh, that fund basic research in physical sciences, but uh, we're at the almost one half level. Uh, so this is supporting about 2,000, I'm sorry, 20,000 PhD students, graduate students, engineers, staff across the country. Um, at DOE labs and also at, in academia as well. And this is really about maintaining U.S. world leadership in scientific computing, computational science, and other areas. So um, we also support physics and materials and, and other things as well. The other half, um, maybe a little bit more than half the funding, goes towards supporting the scientific user facilities. So we have this great research infrastructure where we do the big science. So um, this is for supporting the supercomputers, the particle accelerators, uh, the telescopes, and, and things like that. So, so where are these? Yeah, so, so the type of um, instruments that we're talking about, uh, the DOE uh, owns and operates some of the world's fastest supercomputers. We currently have on the top 500 list the number one and the number two fastest computers, Summit at Oak Ridge and Sierra at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So um, this is a, a quite an achievement uh, that we want to maintain. Uh, but the other types of instruments are X-ray uh, light sources and neutron sources, um, nanoscale science research centers, uh, particle accelerators that I mentioned, uh, things like that. So with these facilities, they're actually open access for researchers to use. So. Just like at NSF, there's a peer review proposal process. So you can actually get time on supercomputers and, and light sources and particle accelerators by writing proposal. There's a certain schedule for these things that you'd have to look up. But uh, people take advantage of, of these user facilities. And I think we support like 27, close to 30,000 people a year at those uh, uh, facilities. Uh, it's free for non-proprietary work that you plan to publish in the open literature. Um, they do have some um, use reserved for non-proprietary work for private companies who just want to use facilities. They have to pay as they go. So, so where is this equipment situated? Well, the DOE has 17 uh, national laboratories. Ten of them are stewarded by the Office of Science, and you can see the 10 listed there. Um, I had the fortune of working at uh, Oak Ridge National, I'm sorry, Oak Ridge National Lab back in 93 to 98. If anyone here from Oak Ridge is here, a little shout out. So, um, 
You may know the nuclear weapons labs, uh, such as Lawrence Livermore, uh, Los Alamos, um, Sandia. So those are stewarded by the NNSA. So, okay, so that's on the facility side. On the research side in the Office of Science, it's broken across six programs. Uh, Oscar is listed first alphabetically, and uh, our mission statement is there. But there are also five other Office of Science programs that focus on various areas, whether it's materials and chemistry or biology and environment and fusion and plasma and, and, and things like that. So um, um, the biggest one is basic energy sciences, and uh, Oscar is second at almost a billion dollars a year um, for the research that we do. So taking a little closer look at the research programs, um, we do have a mission for the research division. Uh, and basically, in a nutshell, it's about enabling technologies. You have all this fantastic high-tech equipment and computers. How do you put the applied math, computer science, and, and um, other research behind it so that people take, take full use of, of that technology? So in the research division, we have three programs. Uh, one, of course, is applied mathematics. And a uh, statement there, it looks that we look at complex and natural engineered systems and the methods and models and analysis tools for that. Uh, of course, we have computer science. You know, how are you going to program these machines and, and you know, use all this equipment? And how do you do data analysis and um, visualize results? So that's a main focus of, of the computer science program. And we also have a computational partnerships. This is how we work with the other five Office of Science programs to get our tools into the hands of the scientists who want to use them on, on the world's fastest machines. So a little bit more detail, the top three I, I covered, well, top two I covered, basic research and, and partnerships. I will say with computational partnerships, they've expanded their mission. So the partnerships are now also looking at quantum computing and setting up test beds and, and doing research in that area. So we're really looking at you know, cutting edge science in terms of computing and um, taking full advantage of it. Um, in addition to the research side, we have the facility side. So we look at you know, how do we network all these facilities together with the computing so people can leverage uh, these resources. And uh, we're also keeping a close eye on the next generation of computing. So we're trying to go beyond petascale. We have an exascale computing project. We're working on the software stack for the type of tools that we need to run on the next generation of machines called exascale that's coming uh, in the early 20s. Um, and then far term, we're also looking at quantum test beds and other future technologies like neuromorphic computing and other things. Uh, it's very important that we develop a, a workforce for this. So on the research side, just like National Science Foundation, we have calls for proposals in applied math and computer science and computational partnerships every year. So um, that's how we attract people to work on the problems that are well aligned with the DOE mission. We also want to keep building the pipeline so that we have early career researchers coming in and support, this looks like the right demographics here, support graduate students as they pursue their degrees. So a little bit more detail about the applied math program. You know, it, it's, so doing the math, so that means develop the, the mathematical and scientific computing foundations to accelerate the pace of science. It's about a $30 million a year program. We have about 50 projects. Uh, across labs and universities, and we support nonprofits like SIAM for hosting workshops and um, uh, other, other um, organizations. Um, people who are using Julia to solve challenging problems will resonate with the core applied math that we focus on, optimization, uncertainty quantification, linear algebra, uh, differential equations, machine learning, all great stuff. Uh, but we also help develop the foundations and put out the tools for the software um, libraries for that uh, work. So people may be familiar with Petsy and Trellinos, and, and I actually worked on sundials when I was at Livermore. But um, people at Argonne and other places work on automatic differentiation, start exploring parallel and time integrators. People are looking at parallel and time integrators for doing, for training in machine learning. So. So it's, it's really interesting techniques and perspectives that people are bringing um, uh, to advances. Uh, we also support larger projects for doing science at our user facilities or focusing on, on the mathematics of enabling a resilient power grid. 
um, doing additive manufacturing. These require slightly larger teams than just a single PI doing the research um, with a few other people. And uh, we have workshops. There's some cover pages at the bottom there about the types of workshops that we have on multiscale mathematics and analyzing petascale data. So that's very important for keeping the ideas and, and reaching out to community to get ideas for what research directions we should pursue. Okay, quickly, um, we do have a computer science program. Again, they're focused on visualization, data management, data analysis, programming models, programming tools, things like that. And for the computational partnerships, our signature program is the SIDAC program, Scientific Discovery to Advanced Computing. Um, and this is the way we partner with the other offices on projects that are of interest to them so that they can take advantage of our facilities to do petaflop, petaflop calculations or take advantage of the next generation computing architecture. So SIDAC has evolved since it was first initiated in 2001. Um, basically, that, that first uh, SIDAC one was just getting people to work together in groups with our applied mathematicians and computer scientists. A lot of bright physicists back then thought they could, they could you know, write the code themselves and, and do everything, but over time, they've come to appreciate that you know, people who have expertise in optimization or linear algebra or op uh, other areas it may make sense to get the state-of-the-art technology and the state-of-the-art libraries into your codes and, and work together to take advantage of the, of the uh, emerging uh, technologies and computers. So the mantra for the first one was just science at the Terra scale, then it's science at the Peta scale. Uh, Side Act 3 in that, uh, those years were looking at multi-core and emerging hybrid architectures, and now we're starting to look at pre-X scale machines and then we're on our way to exascale as well. But again, bringing together teams of domain scientists, applied mathematicians, computer scientists, focusing on using the most advanced computers for solving the challenging problems. <clears throat> so what kind of computational facilities are we talking about? Uh, well, we have NERSCOT at Berkeley. Uh, they look at high-end capacity computing. They service about 7,000 users across over 800 projects. Uh, and their, mach their machine that's coming is called Perlmutter, uh, based on technology from Cray, AMD, NVIDIA. Um, the leadership, leadership computing facilities are at Argonne and Oak Ridge, and some information there about the number of users and, and projects. And of course, tying this all together is this uh, ESnet, um, uh, Energy Sciences Network, that brings together the computers, but also starting to connect with uh, other facilities as well. So the number one fastest computer in the world is Summit at, um, at Oak Ridge, and uh, uses 27,000 NVIDIA Volta GPUs and uh, CPUs, and uh, it's clocked in at about 201 petaflops. But they're seeing that when they, when they start looking at machine learning applications and AI, you know, they can get beyond that, closer to, to an exascale if they start using reduced precision and um, other techniques as well. So um, not only do we have the world's fastest computer, but people are very ambitious in the Department of Energy. They want to start uh, connecting more than one facility with, with other facilities. So bring a supercomputer to your light source or your particle accelerator uh, for on-demand computing. Uh, and this is just showing a little diagram of, of uh, <clears throat> different programs connecting with uh, different computing resources and uh, other details. And in the bottom there, it's just showing that ESnet is like the circulatory system that, that uh, makes all the blood flow and the data flow uh, between these facilities. Uh, so you can imagine you have all this uh, multimodal data, data coming from diverse sources, whether it's experiments or simulations or other measurements. So one of the signature programs that we have out of the Applied Math program is called CAMERA, Center for Advanced Mathematics for Energy Research Applications. And in the diagram, uh, what you'll see in the center there in purple are a set of six key codes that are being used by um, uh, different facilities around the world. Uh, these are codes for doing imaging and uh, data analysis and typography. And uh, on your right-hand side in blue, it shows a type of mathematics that's being leveraged as part of these codes, um, 
mathematics and model-based reconstruction, uh, spectral analysis, machine learning. And on the other side, it's, uh, you know, through the codes, you know, the type of facilities that are taking advantage of those uh, resources. So with a lot of things I mentioned, you can probably just Google the word in DOE and, and find the web page and the website for, for getting more information. <clears throat> but um, again, it's really showing the power of applied mathematics uh, to work across a number of important and difficult challenges. But uh, you need to take a step back and think a little bit more upstream and, and multifaceted about the kind of applied math research you need to do to address the challenges that these scientists have. So that's really the, the key role of the applied math program. Not to use math as a hammer, but to try to understand and not, not do the next Band-Aid or, or scratch the next, next itch, but actually take a step back and think holistically about you know, what kind of applied math is going to be needed to solve this challenge. Okay, so the use of Julia, um, we do have a project at Argonne called Maxer that in a nutshell looks at uh, the power grid, um, making it more resilient, uh, less prone to cascading failures. Uh, it's led by Mihai Anatescu. And uh, when, I, when I put the call out to applied math uh, uh, supported people and asked, you know, who's, who's using Julia in their proje projects, uh, Maxer stepped up right away. It just seems like the optimization folks have really taken uh, Julia uh, un under their wing. So with just a few slides, um, you know, this was the motivation for their using uh, Julia. They were looking at uh, algebraic modern languages. They had a few in mind, but they had some requirements. They wanted the speed of C, C++. They wanted to support nonlinear optimization and other requirements. So uh, short story is uh, Julia seemed to fit the bill back then, and they're continuing to use it, uh, develop uh, packages like Plasmo and um, StructJump. And um, so I'll just leave it at that, that uh, you know, it, Julia is making uh, headway and inroads into the DOE and the way people are doing their science, uh, but I'd like to see more. Um, if I skip over the Plasmo and the Struct Jump, I'll just give a, a shout out to one of the talks we had on Tuesday afternoon. Um, um, Michelle Shannon gave a, a 30 minute talk on this Exascale project and the use of Julia for um, stochastic grid dynamics at Exascale. So, um, again, it looks like an added bonus uh, of this was that uh, you know, use of Julia made it extendable to, to include uh, cybersecurity and, and resilience and uh, be portable to a number of rapidly changing architectures. So, that, that's very impressive and um, no, I, I really like to see this, you know, evolve further. So, so that's on a research side, a little highlight of, of how Julia is being used by one of our uh, premier math centers that's looking at the power grid. Uh, this is a little bit of old news, but uh, you know, I was uh, very proud to see back in two, you know, 2017 that uh, a highlight was Julia is being used by um, a research team, uh, Celeste. Uh, for a project that was cataloging the, you know, the universe and visible objects, but uh, they turned to Julia to do it, and they joined the Petascale uh, Club at 1.54 petaflops per second um, to do that. So um, I, I think it'll be very important for the, the future of Julia that it is actually supported at our user facilities so that as people want to do science, I mean, if they can't use Julia, if they're using Julia and they can't use it on the type of resources that we have, that's, that's not a good thing. So I want to help enable that so that um, you know, Julia can, can be used on, on our most advanced computers and to help people do their science. Okay, so, so that's a little bit of, of Julia. Again, I'd like to see more. Um, what I'd like to describe is the uh, strategic vision of Oscar and where we're headed. And then you and the Julia, Julia crowd can sort of, you know, if you can see yourself in that picture or see a role for Julia to play, you know, that's, that's where we want to go with, with this next part of the talk. So maybe one of the trends that you could see from, from what I've described so far um, for science and technology is I, I see four trends. Um, one is that the world is becoming more instrumented. Uh, there's more sensors out there, um, more people collecting data, um, more powerful equipment can take more data in less time. And uh, these are from sensors and satellites and drones and, and, and everything else that you can think of. 
Uh, it's just that the technology is getting so much better for, for making uh, more rapid and more accurate detections. Uh, second trend, the world is becoming more interconnected. So think about the Internet of Things. You have all these resources that are out there. You know, the, the sum is greater than the whole when you start putting them together and connecting them in the right way. Okay. A third trend is that when you have this more in interconnected, complex infrastructure, you're going to need some degree of automation to help you manage those resources. It's, it's just beyond one person to sort of manually control uh, all the equipment and uh, reproduce that work. So machine learning has a key role to play in, in those complex processes and, and, and the real-time requirements. So when you pull those three together, uh, that's leading to an acceleration, acceleration of the pace of science, that you have more powerful equipment, that you're bringing them together, uh, that you're programming them uh, to do very creative work, doing innovations. Uh, that, that's just um, uh, uh, four things that you can count on. So we're preparing for that. So, um, you know, the, the next five at the bottom there is, you know, we're thinking in terms of post more technologies, what comes after, you know, the current generation of technologies, um, what basic research do we need to do now to prepare for that, um, extreme heterogeneity, that you have GPUs and CPUs and, and TPUs and, and quantum and neuromorphic. Um, you know, uh, you just have an extreme and diverse heterogeneous range of, of memories and processors and, and interconnects. So um, it's not enough just to put those together, but how do you make them useful to the scientists? Um, things are becoming more adaptive. With the, with the modeling and uh, the computing and the use of data. So that's another thing we have our eye on. Um, since we're doing science, uncertainty quantification is critical, that you'll be able to quantify and give some, some confidence about you know, what kind of results that you're getting from these measurements and, and calculations that you're doing. So again, basic research is key. No one else will do that for the Office of Science unless the Applied Math Program does it itself. And finally, it's a data tsunami. And within that tsunami, how do you, how do you find the signal um, in the noise? And do you really need to keep all that data, or can you catch it on the fly and interpret what's happening in, in real time? So um, this is really changing you know, the scientific method. You know, how you think about solving a problem when you have access, access to all this high-tech resources, you want to do all this high-tech science, you, know, you want to figure out some way to manage the complexity, Maybe programming languages can help with that. So to help prepare the applied math program, um, to start thinking about that, we had an applied math principal investigating meeting back in January. So these are the people who are currently funding in the applied math program and some, some invited people from national labs and, and academia. Uh, one of the things I featured in the applied math PI meeting was uh, a lunchtime talk uh, about Julia. So Alan Edelman, uh, came down to, to the D.C. area and uh, gave a lunchtime talk about Julia. What, what caught my eye is, at least from an applied math perspective, is that Julia, the co-creators, won an applied math prize from SIAM, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And that's the first time a programming language has won the award. We've had teams from, from PETC and, and DASL, um, different algebraic equation solvers, win the award. but. I thought it was cool that this was the first time an applied math uh, a programming language uh, won the award. It was very um, well deserved. So I, I took a poll at the applied math PI meeting and uh, you know, sh a show of hands of people who are using Julia, and I'd say about a third, a half raised their hand. So that was, that was pleasing to see. Most of the optimization people did, so I wasn't surprised. <clears throat> uh, also thinking ahead, um, the, at the meeting I had Jupiter. Uh, Shreyas Colia and Fernando um, Perez talk about Jupiter. Of course, the JU stands for Julia, but people are also using Python and R. And um, I'm very pleased to see that the, the Wolfram engine was recently released. And there's a uh, GitHub site for using the Wolfram engine as a kernel within Jupiter. So you have Jupiter Wolf <laughs> uh, now. So. Um, but I, I think Jupiter is important for, for Oscar uh, researchers as well. Just this idea of having computational notebooks and being able to use uh, languages to collect your data as a container and, and reproduce your work and you know, hand that off to, to your colleagues and, and things like that. So 
So that's another thing we're keeping IR, our eye on in the applied math program. Um, I remember, so going to the next slide, I remember getting uh, proposals on machine learning about 10 years ago in the applied math program. And the curious thing was I'd get a proposal, 15 pages, and I'd go from one end to the other and not see a single equation. <laughs> and I'd go back and I'm sure there were some diagrams and pictures, but sure enough back then it was some type of machine learning program or, or proposal that you know, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how do I send this out for review? I mean, is there some optimization component that needs to be addressed? Is there some linear algebra that, that needs to be you know, explored? So we really didn't get into machine learning until late in the game. Um, so for the Applied Math PI meeting, uh, I was very uh, glad that Gil Strang uh, was able to come down from MIT and he showcased his new book on, on learning from data. But uh, if you haven't taken a look at it, I think this will be the, the new textbook for you know, how people learn uh, deep learning uh, in undergraduate courses or graduate courses. So um, it really does um, look at the underlying mathematics, thank you, uh, of, of machine learning. So, and that's, of course, great news for the applied math community. Um, another thing we've had our eye on in applied math for machine learning is this new journal with uh, editor-in-chief Tammy Kolda. And again, this is looking at the mathematics of data science, not using you know, uh, techniques and, and machine learning as a hammer, but looking at the underlying methods and approaches that are being developed and figuring out what the next generation of those tools are. So um, it's, it's off to a great start. They're getting a lot of submissions. Um, take a peek when you have a chance. So, so that was at one meeting uh, a few months ago. But even further back, we've been preparing for the future with a workshop, and I'll just briefly touch on this, on looking at extreme heterogeneity. And again, you can Google the term, and there's a 100-page workshop report uh, that lists uh, a handful of prior to research directions for, you know, how do you remain productive in computational science in the face of all these uh, changes in architectures and processors and, and memory and, and, and things like that. So um, this is a start of getting people thinking about this. And uh, of course, when we have a workshop, we often want to have some sort of calls for proposals for people who have ideas uh, to, the address, to address the challenges uh, in these reports. So again, if you're a computer scientist or have ideas, uh, take a look at that. And um, um, I think it's very important to get a contribution from the Julia community. Um, also, at the same time, so this was a workshop that started in January of 2018. Uh, the following week, we had a workshop on what we're calling scientific machine learning. <clears throat> so this is really about machine learning for science. This is not machine learning for, you know, recommending movies or, or filtering spam. You know, those, those maybe have a, a lot lower uh, requirements than using and trusting machine learning and AI techniques for, for science. So as part of that uh, workshop, um, we put together a committee. And in the fall of 2018, 2017, uh, we, we took a, a survey of you know, the machine learning papers that are out there and looked at them from the perspective of applied mathematics. And uh, here's just the, the outline of the table of contents for that pre-workshop report. But uh, you can see we split it up into different types of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised. And then we looked at some cross-cutting topic areas in applied mathematics, such as you know, rigorous analysis for these approaches, uh, the use of model reduction and multi-fidelity modeling. So the main idea there was before we even went into the workshop, we had a, a pre-workshop report that everybody read beforehand so that everybody was more or less on the same page about Yes, we've talked about that. We know about that. You know, we have a common understanding about you know, where applied math stands for machine learning. And then the purpose of the workshop was to then, OK, what's the future directions? What are the priority directions where applied math can have a real advantage uh, in advancing machine learning? So I will say I am concerned about machine learning. Uh, there's a lot of hype, <laughs> OK? and. Uh, you need the basic research um, underpinning it to understand it and, and um, 
take advantage of it. So here's a little cartoon. I'll just briefly go through it. But uh, you have this hype curve where there's some trigger, you know, machine learning, and uh, people have all these wild expectations, reports of it's working great. I mean, I, I'm very thrilled that we have things like um, what is it, the, the, the Go champion from DeepMind that was based on deep learning. Um, there's other examples of, of machine learning and deep learning having fantastic results. But um, um, some people are getting carried away. So we need basic research to help raise that level of understanding so that we sort of smooth out that, you know, that um, deflated feeling. So, and, and people know AI has been through several winters already. Everyone thought back in the 80s that AI was, was uh, right around the corner. But it's come and gone, but now it looks like it's going to stay. And um, we're in a competition with China and, and other countries for you know, making full use of machine learning and AI you know, for our own competitiveness. Um, I'm running a little bit short on time, so let me just briefly go through the priority research directions that came out of the uh, Scientific Machine Learning Workshop Report. And I, I hope these are not a surprise to anybody, but let's, let's walk through them anyway. Uh, so there are six. Um, the first three are what we're calling foundational themes. So one, one foundational theme is domain-aware scientific machine learning. We often know a lot about the problem, a lot about the physics of the problem, and how do we build that into the machine learning techniques that we're developing. So um, it's a significant opportunity to complement the work that we've been doing in that scientific area. Uh, we often know that there are some physical principles, some symmetries, some constraints, um, some uncertainties um, with the work that, we, that we're um, addressing. So how do we build that in and uh, build in domain knowledge? Okay. The second one is interpretability. Okay. How do you understand or explain the results that you're getting? Will you, understand, will you trust results if you can't explain how you, how you came up with the answer? Um, how do you debug a code if you don't understand how it's working or um, what, what's going on? So some way of uh, building some measure of interpretability or explainability into the use of uh, machine learning approaches is going to be very important. And again, this is foundational, just like incorporating domain knowledge. And then the third foundation is uh, robust scientific machine learning. That, um, it's not unduly sensitive to perturbations in the data that you give it or the data that is trained on, that you're not getting deep faked in some way. Uh, how do you build in robustness into those machine learning techniques? Okay, so, so there you have it, the, the foundational areas. And those really get at the core of what math basic research does anyway with um, you know, stability analysis and accuracy and robustness and things like that. So what does that mean in the context of machine learning? Okay, the next three are what we're calling uh, capability priority research direction. So, you know, I showed or explained that, you know, DOE has all these the scientific equipment, all these different research programs. People have a lot of challenges, but bottom line is what we identified were three, just three major main use cases for how machine learning and AI are being used across the entire department. So if you have feedback on whether those are the right three, that's great, but uh, it's, it's been a year now, it seems to be holding true for, for a, lot of, um, a lot of people. So the first use case uh, is not surprising, data-intensive machine learning. You have a pile of data, you want to you know, extract the signal from the noise. Okay, just using machine learning to train it on some subset of the data, maybe build in some domain knowledge and other information, but um, coming up with a result just based on the data that you have uh, in hand. Okay. The second major use case is I was very, really excited about. Um, it's combining machine learning with scientific simulations. So using machine learning to come up with better surrogates or submodels within some larger hierarchical simulation or using uh, machine learning to help steer a computation. You often have a lot of parameters in a computational model. Often they're picked by intuition or expert judgment. You know, maybe machine learning can help lend a hand for help choose those parameters better or finding the best parameters to use. Um, 
This is getting at also combining data with simulation as well. So feeding in data in real time with the simulation that's going on. Uh, how, that's significantly different than just analyzing data by itself, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, we call that the inner loop. That's too inside the beltway kind of language. We call that, we actually call it machine learning enabled uh, scientific simulation. Okay, and then the third case, again, I mentioned we have all these scientific use facilities with very complex equipment. The third case is about, really about complex systems. Using machine learning and AI to help manage power grids or provide cybersecurity or, um, um, yeah, things, things like that. We call it outer, on the outer loop, you have these complex systems and processes. How do you use AI and machine learning to, to control those? It really gets at the decision support, understanding systems of systems. How does that connect up with machine learning and, and AI? Okay. And, okay, so, so here in a nutshell, I listed the foundational themes and also the um, capability themes as well. So um, advances from applied math and scientific computing perspective in any or combination of those areas could really help advance the DOE mission because AI and machine learning are critical to those use cases that I just mentioned. So, um, and it was very helpful to sort of group people into people who are using it for uh, decision support of complex systems or probably looking at a different flavor of machine learning AI than people are using for, for data analysis, so. Okay, so, um, with that workshop report, also be aware that uh, in 2016, there was a national AI R&D strategic plan. Uh, it's been recently updated and published uh, back in June. So again, if you Google that, you can see that DOE and, and the nation are trying to come up with their own strategic plan for AI R&D. And uh, they came up with eight, there were seven, now eight um, st strategies for doing that. Um, I highlight number two because uh, the scientific machine learning workshop report that I just mentioned is highlighted, highlighted in strategy two as one approach for putting together a strategic plan at a national level. Uh, number seven is highlighted because DOE also has a graduate fellowship program and that's also mentioned in this national AI plan. Um, please be aware also that over the next four months, July, August, September, October, there are one each month, a set of AI for Science town hall meetings. The first one was just on Monday and Tuesday up at Argonne. Uh, the next one in August is at Oak Ridge, uh, September's at uh, Berkeley, and then the fourth one is here in the DC area. But uh, just like we did for Exascale 10 years ago, we started to have big meetings where we energize the community about the promise and benefits and research needed for Exascale. The same case is being made now for AI for science. Couple minutes. So the Applied Math program is preparing for this kind of future, these town halls, these national strategic plans, uh, these emerging trends. Uh, item one there just says that scientific machine learning has foundations and use cases, which I mentioned. And the real, su real success here will be when machine learning and AI just sort of fade into the woodwork, where you just naturally embed it into your calculations or um, research that you do, and it's not such a, a big deal like it is now with trying to do uh, a call out of research. But at some point, it just makes things more adaptive, more automated. People will understand it well enough to use it on a routine basis. And that's what um, the table at the bottom is showing that, uh, um, for example, data intensive science, that's about doing massive data analysis. The Applied Math Program has had a history of funding announcements in that area. So that's the foundation for, for doing data intensive machine science, scientific machine learning. The same for adaptive modeling and intelligent automation and decision support. Uh, so in that sense, the Applied Math Program has laid the groundwork for using machine learning and AI for scientific purposes. Uh, again, with these trends of massive data, predictive models and algorithms, heterogeneous computing, uh, the trend is for using humans in combination with AI approaches uh, to do science in a you know, fundamentally different way. So, um, and wrapping up, so not only doing it, you know, so we really see this trend coming. We hope we, this, we share this with you. Um, 
To help do that, we need future leaders. So, for example, we have a DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Program. Um, the details uh, you can look up, but we have a lot of bright people who uh, take advantage of this to finance their graduate uh, school research, but also spend a summer or two at national labs doing practicums, uh, working on these advanced uh, high-tech equipments and working with leading scientists who are pursuing the same path that uh, I outlined. So final thoughts is really about Julia for advanced scientific computing research. Um, hopefully some of the things I said resonated with you in this room. Um, maybe at future meetings I can report about how Julia is being used by our researchers and, and scientists and what, what uh, great results you're getting. But this is really about uh, thinking about Julia in terms of productive computational science, um, how Julia can be used for enabling scientific machine learning and AI. Um, are we still going to be programming machines the way we're doing it now? Or, or are there some new things to think about? Because what we're seeing is that you know, training is the new programming. You don't have to explicitly program something in, say, C++, but if you train a machine learning program with enough of the right kinds of data, you can have it be used in you know, data analysis or combined with simulations or um, to, to automate complex uh, infrastructures. So um, we need to have a closer, closer connection between DOE, Oscar, and the Julia community, so I hope by coming here and, and uh, telling you about uh, who we are and what we do, that uh, this was the start of a good conversation. Thank you. So, uh, first question for you. Um, because the Department of Energy is an American organization and the Julia community is international, um, can you speak to uh, funding opportunities for Julia community members um, to contribute to research efforts through the DOE based on like, citizenship. Does the PI, for example, of a DOE project have to be American, or can they be a resident, or how, how does that work? Is this, this more for like international collaborations, or? Yeah, yeah, so to secure DOE funding, um, does the PI, for example, have to be an American citizen? and? Do they have to pay American citizens, or can you speak to that? Okay, I, I can say a few words. So, so typically we do, um, we, we fund um, researchers at domestic institutions, you know, here in the U.S., but oftentimes people can subcontract um, to, to other uh, institutions, whether they are in the U.S. or, or elsewhere, but by and large it's mainly um, um, fund, funding U.S. Uh, researchers and we're not prohibited from including, you know, more of an international um, um, collaborations. Thank you very much. Can you say something about the sort of overall scale and number of projects that you fund? It, it, as I was listening to you describe your interests and your work, yes. it was striking to me how many of those kinds of things are actually bubbling up from the Julia community already through mm -hmm. efforts of, in some cases, fairly small individual people or fairly small groups of people. Sure. Are, are, is a single person project the kind of thing you're interested in, or are you only interested in 30 person collaborations, or is it all over the map? A, a good question. We have a variety of um, projects ranging from single investigator and like early career researchers, but also small teams as well. And I mentioned earlier, like this camera project is a, you know, uh, maybe a dozen or more researchers working together. Uh, across the light sources. Uh, the scale of the projects, as I mentioned, uh, Applied Math Program is currently at 30 million a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to be at 50 million a year, mm -hmm. but some money got taken away from the X scale, from Exascale, but uh, we're looking to regrow the Applied Math Program. We think we have a, a solid plan for doing that. And um, um, the computer science is also at the same scale, currently about 25 million, but hoping to reach 50 million. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot that can be done on both the applied math and the computer science side in terms of uh, a Julia um, mm -hmm. research for it and, and applications. Cool. Okay. So we have a, a couple announcements for you, so it would be great if you could hang around for just a minute or two longer, but first let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> <laughs>